<clears throat> okay, we are live. Well, it's been a fun week. I guess it's been very cold for all of us. I know. I know. I'm, I was pretty cold out there, trying to go and pick up the wife, dropping off at Sam's, and she had to actually put on her like these boots because winter boots because sometimes she's at the door checking IDs at the Sam's Club, and, and uh, it gets cold, and all that door's always constantly open. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow is supposed to go up to 33. The high, and so it'll be a heat wave. Like, <laughs> you know, I remember in Mexico, I lived over four years when I was there pastoring, and, and I had my winter jacket, the same one here. It was 60 degrees, and I was putting on my gloves on and my winter jacket to walk my dog. At 60 degrees, I was freezing. So, when I got here in December of 22, I remember it went on the 23rd, went to minus nine here. Oh, that was a shock for me from going from freezing at 60 to minus 9, let me tell you, it was cold. So uh, anyway, looks like uh, we are one minute to go. Anybody else joining us? Your wife. Must be the, my precious, virtuous wife. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Guten Morgen. Oh, that's German. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Hello. She's the only one that keeps me going, keeps me alive, keeps me in mind. There's nothing like a good man, but there's a better woman that's supposed to keep her in line, so sometimes she straightens me out. She may be little, but you know, those Hondurans, they got these machetes, you know, you got to be careful. <laughs> I always tease her. She says, I'll stop it, be quiet, Roberto. But she calls me Amorcito. That's like little, a little amor, a little love. She don't call me Bob, past Bob, not to Robert, but she calls me Mi Amorcito, my little love. That's sweet, isn't it? Anyway, we're going to get started. It is 11 a.m. We welcome you all and welcome those who are watching live streaming. This is Believers Together, because together we are believers. And we just thank the Lord every day that even in the midst of the cold weather, which has went across the whole USA and probably parts of the world, it's been, I think they even got snow down in, uh, in, in, in Texas, I've seen, I think parts of Florida, uh, even Guatemala, I think we got, we got in the mountains. I mean, it got snow, so it got cold. What about this global warming, I think? Is that so? Yeah. My, mom lives in, uh, my mom lives in Florida, and she said it got down to 60. It was cold. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But it snowed in Arkansas. I've seen snow in Tennessee. I mean, it was, uh, it got pretty down right chilly. So if you get chilly, you go home and make some chilly to warm you up. So anyway, uh, so we just, I'm just so excited. It's, it's a good idea. And uh, so anyway, it's exciting. I'm Pastor Bob Teresiak, Dr. Bob, if you will. I have a doctor of biblical theology, so you know. And I uh, just love serving the Lord. I was talking a little bit about my testimony to the kids earlier in Mariani, and uh, I've been serving the Lord now full-time, pretty much 10, 20 years, but more than that, many years, just about since I got saved in the year 2000, where I came to the Lord and was delivered from the spirit of religion into a walking relationship with the Lord. And I just love reading the Word. I love growing in God's grace. And so, um, anyway, we're going to get started in just some announcements at BelieversTogether.org or the San Felipe Believers Facebook page. You can find this, the handout. It's got all the words of the songs we're going to sing. And on the back side, it's got the uh, uh, scripture reading, the message, and then sermon points, and the closing song. And there's ties and love offerings you want. There's a box back there if you want to give a love offering. Or you can email me electronically through PayPal or Zelle and all of other things or drop it in my door or whatever. But if you use help, it helps for the website, it helps pay for the papers, help for little things that uh, you know that it all helps with no offerings and helping in as well in Mariana. So that you can find on the website as also on Facebook.com forward slash San Felipe Believers. And so we welcome all those who are watching live and the songs are there and everything we need is do we need one Mariana? You need one. Yeah. And wait a minute, let me see the scripture is Acts 16. Yeah. Here, here. No, no, I, I, I got it on my uh, iPad. I'm okay. Okay. So we're good. It's all there. So anyway, so we're going to start. And also, by the way, two announcements. Uh, again, we have Bible studies locally here at 4 o'clock every Tuesday and Thursday. That's right here in this room. And also, we have a Believers Together online one at 1 o'clock Eastern Time every Tuesday and Thursday. And that's at, uh, if you use Google Meet, and if you want, you can go to the website, believestogether.org, and you find on the Bible stars, you'll find the uh, handout that's for it, the questions, and the Google Meet link. You click on that, and you come up at that time, and it, you just you interact live video streaming. So if you've got a laptop, or an iPad, or an iPhone, or a phone, if you can 
access with your camera and you know, in, in your microphone. You can communicate with us, and that's at 1 o'clock here, local time, here. And we go through verse through verse of the Bible. Tuesdays, right now, we're in 1 Thessalonica. Uh, 1 Thessalonians, excuse me. And, uh, and Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're finish, almost finishing Isaiah, the whole book of Isaiah. We've been doing it now for almost a year. So we're going through verse by verse. And that's the good way. It's called expository preaching and teaching, which I do, same here. And so, so if you have also any prayer requests, we've got a cards back there if you want to put right down your prayer request, or you can send it to me to rtorasiak at gmail.com. That's all on Facebook uh, and the website. If you have any prayer requests, or knock on my door here locally. We're glad to pray for you, anything that you need, because every Tuesday and Thursday we pray, and I pray every day with Mariana. So, um, you know, no problem there. Just give me prayer requests, and we will pray for you. It's important. Prayer is important as well. And also, uh, how's prayer? Okay. And at the first Sunday of the month, we do the Lord's Supper right here, and those at home. So that'll be coming up, not next weekend, but the following, I believe, when we get into February. It's the first Sunday in February. All right. Uh, so we're going to start with an opening prayer and a scripture reading. Um, would you like to do that, Ruby? So start with a prayer. Open us up a prayer and, and that scripture reading, and then we'll go into our worship music. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the fact that we can come together and have the freedom to worship you. We thank you for Pastor Bob and Sister Mariana. We thank you for those here with us and those listening online, Lord. And we just ask that you would bless each and every person here with your word and with the knowledge that Pastor Bob has. We praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture reads in Acts 16, it's maybe a scripture reveals scripture. This is supporting scripture that was going on at the time with Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas. When we get to this, Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison, and fasten their feet in, in the stocks. Amen. Thank you, Sister Ruby. And now we're going to go through your handouts. We have also in the Blessed Assurance. Is that the first song? Right? Blessed Assurance? Yes. So we'll start and singing Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. This is my story, this is 
song it is really is he is great so let's sing this song my lord how great thou art oh lord oh lord my god when i in awesome
evil and everything's around us. You know, this world will pass away, but the kingdom of God is forever. Hallelujah. And so that's most important. So we're going to go to our word of uh, scripture as we continue in expository preaching of the word of God. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. We've already gone through it. We're going to go see that. But uh, as you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 8, the title of the message is, Who Are You Pleasing? It's a question. Who are you pleasing? And this is part of the whole kind of series, this theme of 1 uh, Thessalonians, as Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas are writing. And the basic theme is holiness in view of the coming of Christ. Holiness in the view of the coming of Christ. And this, and this series is part four. And again, 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. And so, um, previously we looked at some important issues in part 1, for example, we've seen the importance of prayers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Even unified prayer among Paul, Paul Silvanus, and Silvanus, and Timothy. And because those, they who exemplified the example and the importance of prayer for, for us as an example. And of course the importance of faith, hope, and love especially it's right in the midst of what we're facing in this world. Part two, we looked at the elect of God as knowing, known and chosen by God, who God's love, and that through the Holy Spirit, the gospel is delivered in the word, in power, and with conviction. And then, of course, Christians, as we and I, as we reveal the proof of true Christianity to others, not only by our words, but by our actions. Then, last week, we looked in part three of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10, and we discover the importance of following, what, the lead of the apostles and, of course, the lead of Jesus Christ as our example. And we had to become imitators of them. And so that was important to see the examples of the apostles, even on the persecution, on the struggling, on the suffering. They remember that the Word of God must continue to go through and go forward, revealing God's love, deliverance from idolatry, and, of course, as they were awaiting for the return of Jesus Christ, which is the general theme of 1 Thessalonians. And then today, of course, is part four. We will continue to discover Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silas, how they declare the importance of bringing the gospel, even through persecution, to please God, not men, glorify God, not man, and to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Amen. So let's look at our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. This is God's holy word. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been Shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Let's pray a moment. Father, God in heaven, we thank you for this word. Your word is truth. Father, help us to grow and to learn and worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, today we ask you to help us to receive it, to transform us and renew our minds and our hearts. And Father, you would help me to speak as an oracle of God. And we do pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord. Amen and amen. amen. So we are now continuing in 1 Thessalonians. It's letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silvanus is right to the church at Thessalonica and just bringing about a true letter of encouragement, of understanding and wisdom, even in the midst of what they're going through. And of course, we, we discovered that Thessalonica, Thessalonica was a town on the east side of Macedonia, which is now part of Thessaloniki, which is called, which is part of the east side of Greece. And it was a major important crossroads. Probably 100 to 200,000 people lived there. And a lot of, lot of uh, uh, polytheism, many multiple gods they worship. And of course, the, most of the church at Thessalonica were, 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 were Gentile people, not, not I mean, Jews, but mostly Gentiles. And of course, this was a huge change. And we know that in Acts 16 and 17, talks about where Apostle Paul was run out of the town of Thessalonica because he was bringing the gospel. And oftentimes, as we know, the world will hate us 
because Jesus was hated first, the world, the world will hate us as well. And of course, when we speak the true gospel of Christ and we deliver the gospel, uh, people will hate you for that. And they will hate you unless they were born again. Otherwise, they're spiritually blind. They don't see what we see. As believers, we see the glory of God. We see His majesty. We see Him as who He is and understand. And we know, we know beyond knowing that we know that we have the Lord God in our hearts because we were born from above, not of this world. And so we see that it's important as we continue. Apostle Paul is encouraging them, bringing this message letter, and of course he is longing to see them again. He wants to be there, but you know, for now, they're writing this letter to encourage them to keep their faith, keep pressing on. The word of the gospel has been spreading to, throughout Macedonia and Archaea and other places. And so this is a powerful time. So we're going to come to our first point. First point is this, it's on your hand out there. Believers have to continue to bring the gospel expecting results. Believers that can continue to bring the gospel expecting the results. Let me ask you a question. Do you all of you understand the concept of being ineffective in something or lacking results? Sometimes we get caught up in doing something and we try and try and again. It seems like we're not getting anywhere. We're, not, we're getting, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again without going anywhere with it, right? So it's kind of a similar thing. But when it comes to the gospel, we know the Bible says the word of God never comes back void. When we speak the word, when we speak life, when we speak the word of God to others, it never comes back void. It's going to do what God's intended and purpose is and his plan is for all of us and for those as we witness to the world what the God is, the true God, the only God of the word of God, the Bible, the truth of God's word. So it's important. So when it says there in verse 1 of chapter 2, For you yourself know, brothers, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas went to Thessalonica for what? A godly purpose. And mission to what? To bring the gospel, the good news of Christ to that city. The task of going to them was not in vain. In other words, it wasn't futile. You know, that word vain in the Greek is kinos, kinos. What it, what it's defined as is pertaining to being lacking in results or without result or without effect. So when he says there that our coming to you was not Without results, without any, in, 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 not ineffective, but it was effective. And that's what he's talking about. It wasn't in vain. It wasn't futile. You know, like I just said, when we go out and we bring the gospel to others, when we go and share the word, when we go and witness to others, or testify of our testimonies, that's, that's your truth. That's a fact. Your experience with God. Nobody can take that away because that's your word. That's what you experienced. And of course, when we, in the Word, when it goes forward, it never comes back void. It will go and cut through the heart, the body, bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and it'll go right to the heart of the matter. And it'll, it'll cut the people. It'll convict them to either receive the gospel or reject the gospel. Say, uh -uh, no, that's not for me. And you know, sometimes when we witness, sometimes we tell the people of Jesus, sometimes we're just, we're seed planters. We seed, we plant it. And sometimes it takes another person to water. Sometimes another person, the Bible says, to bring it. It took me 10 years, from 1990 to 2000, of seven different people planting seeds in my life, over those years, to finally, this stubborn Pollock, to say, yeah, okay, I'm going to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, because I was convicted, the Word of God, I opened the Bible, God showed me, opened my eyes, and bam! It was a road to Damascus experience, hallelujah. Powerful. Word of God can do that to us. So it didn't come in vain. There was a purpose behind it. It wasn't lacking results. So God had a purpose and plan in mind for Paul at Thessalonica. They were how, how? They were guided by the Holy Spirit and walked in obedience to the Holy Spirit's leading as to not lack any results. They were on fire for the Lord. They knew they were willing to die for the Lord. Apostle Paul later received that in his mission work that he you know, was going to go to Rome and he was willing to die for the gospel. You know, even the prophetic word of prophecies and prophets would tell him, no, no, go, we, we don't want, you know, but he said, he said, I'm not trying to die. I'm, I'm willing to die for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he did eventually. The work of the Lord was not in vain. You know, I want to share a little bit about, how many of you heard of Thomas Edison? Many of the kids here might have heard, they probably studied about him. Well, he was a willing achiever, and he, failure never overwhelmed him. Speaking of, you know, trying to do that same thing and continue to, to you know, do futile work, people think, you know, how are you going to do that? Well, Thomas, Thomas Edison was one of the most recognized names in invention history, inventive, when he, he made a lot of inventions, right? And so he had a bunch of innovative ideas and created a legend. His creations were legendary. And he had more than, guess what, a thousand patents 
which only a record was broken recently of that. He developed groundbreaking technologies like the electric light bulb, the phonograph, the kids probably don't know what a phonograph is, but we know the old 33 LP, 78 and 45. So, uh, and batteries and so much more. Well, speaking of batteries, despite his outstanding success, Edison failed frequently. In fact, sometimes it took thousands of attempts, literally, to perfect his experimentation. And that's exactly what happened when Edison was working to devise a storage battery. So we have batteries today. According to his close friend, Walter S. Mallory, Edison had already tried 9,000 experiments and hadn't yet found a solution. And when Mallory commented about the lack of results, Edison promptly responded and said, Results? Why, man? I have got lots of results. I know several thousand, several thousand things that won't work. <laughs> so, you know, so yet his experiments were not in vain but achieved results in the invention of what? The battery. So it took a lot of times, you know, to make these trial and error, trial and error, but it finally worked. You know, they had, he had an expectation. He wasn't going to quit. And that's the same thing when it comes to uh, the fact that we are to continue to bring the gospel expecting results. Because again, we've got a Savior. We've got a God that's greater than all this worth. He's beyond time, space, and matter. He's not limited by those things like we are. And he can make things happen in that way. But he look, he's looking for faithfulness. He's looking for workers that will go and say, Yes, Lord, who, who shall I send? Send me, Lord, like he said Isaiah. So, you know, we have to continue in our faith. And our faith as Christians is not in vain as well. There is an expected result, evidence of a true faithful followers of Christ. Of course, because we know there is fruit of the Spirit. We have fruit, you know, love, goodness, kindness, self-control, humility, Mercy, all those things come about when we are truly born again of God. And of course, we, when we bring the gospel, knowing that the word of God never comes back void. You know, our work for the Lord will always bring results, and that's a fact. Sometimes it's not something we expect. Sometimes it gets rejected. But that's not to get us down or depress us to say, oh man, I'm a failure of evangelism or I failed to witness. We need to continue to say, okay, Lord, I can be used. You know, I planted a seed. Now, maybe someone else is going to come along. We never know. Who God, who's God's chosen ones or not. We just go, we're messengers. We're ambassadors to bring the word of God. Second part is this. True believers continue to boldly bring the gospel even in the midst of suffering or persecution, right? True believers continue to boldly bring the gospel even in the midst of suffering. Let me ask you a question. How many of you understand that there is hatred by the world to Christians? We can see it all around us, even in the USA now, more and more and more. Christians are hated. Uh, that one gentleman, the Stroud for the Houston, the, the Texans there, I guess, he, he mentioned Jesus and his testimony of how he won the game. He was so happy when he was praising God and mentioned Jesus. Well, later on, they edited Jesus out of that. Oh, we, we can't mention Jesus. Well, why not? Well, because they don't like to hear the name of Jesus. I like to hear the name of Jesus. My ears go big. Oh, yeah? Well, what's someone's talking about Jesus? Let's go find out who's talking about Jesus. That's great to hear about Jesus. My Lord and my personal Savior. Hallelujah. Our Savior. It's good to hear the name of Jesus. And we should be boldly and speak that and never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of salvation both to the Jew and to the Gentile. It's what God's word says. So remember that. In particular, all countries throughout the, of the world, there is all kinds of uh, false religions and people following false gods and idolatry and everything else. But we as Christians in Christianity, there is only one true faith, one hope, one love, one gospel, and that is through Jesus Christ alone, period. Yeah, well, Pastor Bob, you must be, you're, you're pretty intolerant, now some people say. You're a bigot, you're this and that, you're this and all these things. I said, well, I'm sorry, but that's what Jesus said. If Jesus said it, I believe it, and that case closed, amen. You don't like it, take it up with God. I didn't send him. God sent Jesus. He came down on his own. He went to the cross. He paid for my sentence personally. Buddha didn't do that. Confucius didn't do that. Mohammed didn't do that. Only Jesus went to that cross. Period. Notice in verse 2 of our text today. But though we had already suffered and been shamed and treated at Philippi, as you know, they had fullness. And I dare God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So Paul is reminding here in his letter, his epistle to the church at Thessalonica, of the suffering they experienced at Philippi, as well as at Thessalonica, and all through all his different missionary journeys, because as we know, Paul was chased out of that city as well. Yet while they were there, they delivered the good news, the gospel with boldness, not fearing man, but with the fear of God. 
The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom in the Bible says. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And that fear is this R of God, this, this servant of God. Of, we are slaves, the bond servants of, of righteousness. And he is enslaved, and, he, we are, and, and our master is our Lord and Savior, God. So they preach even during great conflict. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas, as we see most of the time, though we use the pronoun we, us, you know, in his writing here, they will focus on the gospel to deliver the gospel, even what? If it meant suffering for the truth thereof. I don't know how many times, like I said, in my part, past where uh, in boldness, oftentimes I was uh, treated wrongly or, or accused of this or that or being intolerant because I always claim that there's only one way, the narrow gate, and that's only through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Oh, no, 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 but, but, but there's many ways to God. Well, not, not, that's not what my Bible says. This is my, this is my, this is my life, uh, life manual. Here and beyond the grave. I have to read this. This is where truth comes from. You know, Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, well, what is truth? I said, Jesus said in John 4, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty narrow. If you want to come in here, I remind you, well, that's what Jesus said. And he's alive, and he's up there, and hallelujah, I, I worship a living God. We worship a living God. You know, speaking of boldness in the midst of suffering, as the gospel goes forth, how many heard of Tertullian? Well, he lived from 155 to 220 A.D. after Christ. And he was a prolific early Christian author from Carthage uh, in the Roman province of Africa. He was the first to produce an extensive corpus of Latin Christian literature. And he was an early Christian apologist and a polemicist against heresy, including contemporary Christian Gnosticism then. Well, Tertullian, Tertullian declared, said this, According to boldness and suffering, he said this, quote, Kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. Every single drop of our blood springs up in some 30, some 60, and some even 100-fold, end quote. Martyrdism, martyrdism, and, you know, to be martyred and to be given below, that half the time it always was the opposite. The devil wants to stop and stop the flow of the gospel, to kill, murder, destroy, and, and you know, attack us and molest us and lie to us and try to mislead and deceive. But even when someone's God increased, most of the time, because it's their true cause, the gospel gets bigger and it even spreads more during times of people being martyred. It's powerful. And that's exactly what happens. Well, let me ask you this. Who suffered even greater? Well, Christ walked on this earth and suffered, imagine beyond, I don't think we could understand how much of the wrath of his Father God poured upon his Son Jesus on the cross. We, I think the Holy Spirit gives us a mount because we see that, wow, he paid for my sin, but I don't think we can ever imagine everybody's sin all through the world through all time was poured upon his Son Jesus Christ. That is just beyond, I, I can't even think and imagine what that was. But I make it personal, and we need to make it personal, that he died for our sin. Our sin, what we committed, when we feel God, because we're all sinners, we've all fallen short of God's glory. Well, I'll tell you what, speaking of boldness, I believe now's the time for the church to stand up, because we must all, and many times in our lives I have, and will probably will continue, we must make a stand for the name of Jesus Christ. There is no room to give into the urge to cut and run in cowardly retreat. We must stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Point three. Believers, believers are to deliver the gospel to please and glorify God and Him alone. Believers are to deliver the gospel to please and glorify our Lord. Let me ask you a question. Who are you pleasing as a Christian? The world or the Lord God? So often the worldly stand is what pleases and makes me feel good rather than care what God thinks or what He sees. Paul, Silas, and Timothy continue their discourse Justifying their genuine service in their ministry, which was approved by God, in which they were trusted with bringing what? The good news, the gospel. That's what they did. They delivered the gospel, not pleasing man, but pleasing God with boldness. I'm going to share four specific confirmations of their efforts for the Lord in the, at the Thessalonica church in verse 3, 3 through 6 of our text. Four specific confirmations. The first one is this. They delivered the truth of the gospel with no falsehoods or deceptions. Look at verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity 
or any attempt to deceive. So we see that there was no lying, there's no deception. They weren't like the liar pants on fire, the devil. It was only the Lord bringing the word of truth, the gospel, with no falsehoods, no lies, and it totally no error, no impurity, nothing to deceive. Secondly, the confirmation that the ministry was approved by God, that they were trusted to bring the one and only gospel, to speak and declare the truth of the word of Christ. Thirdly, the confirmation that they were to please God and not man. They were to please God and not man. This confirmation. Why? Because why? Because he says that because God tested their hearts. God tests the hearts of his chosen elect, born again believers. He knows that he tests us. And sometimes he chastises us. He punishes us. He corrects us. Because sometimes we get off the path. And he wants to bring us back on. And he tests us. And God's allowed to. Job, he was tested pretty good, wasn't he? We read the story about Job, where I tell you, he lost everything, but his faith remained. He stood and stood firm on his faith and the power of God, even losing so much in his life. Many of us have suffered loss of a loved one, or maybe something happened in our lives, but something happened, or we, we suffered for a reason, we've gone through a severe illness or sickness, but God was still there. He's always there for us, holding our hand, ready to, to, to comfort us, and to help us, to heal us, to get us through those times. It's because of our sin nature we have sickness in this world. But there's hope for something beyond that. When we trust in the Lord no matter what, lean not on our own understanding, but when we trust in what God has for us. And that's hard to do sometimes in our flesh. But in the Holy Spirit, that's greater than He does than He is the world, we can overcome through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. When temptation comes, rises, when things come, sicknesses, we can pray, we can, we can get together with believers, we can trust each other and, and go through, you know, to be there for each other and then trust in God that carries through those times. Thirdly, the confirmation that we're to please God and not man because he tested God. Okay, and in verse 4 we see that, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. Fourthly, the confirmation they spoke, the truth directly with no ulterior motive. Verse 5, for it never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is their witness. And so we see that they, they spoke the truth directly. They weren't about money, you know, send your money, come on, you'll see all these televangelists. What are they doing? They're just getting richer and richer, telling you, oh, you can see, you, just send your money, you can be healed, you know, all this stuff. Don't believe the hype, don't believe the lies. They're not doing it for the Lord, they're doing it to put money in their own pockets. Be careful, be careful on what you watch and what you see on TV or radio, listen to. Test it to the word of God. Jesus had no place to lay his head on this earth. He didn't wear a Rolex, okay? <laughs> he wasn't a Rolex at the time. He was a man who humbly served and came down. He had no place to lay his head. He, he had no home. He was out there doing the Father's will. That's all he had. His kingdom was not of this world. And he preached the kingdom of God that goes beyond this world, beyond the material things of this world. Lay your treasures in heaven, not upon this earth, where moth and rust will destroy, but lay your treasures in heaven. Think kingdom. And fifthly, Paul, Timothy, and Silas glorified God and not abused their apostolic roles. Look at verse 6. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. They didn't use their position and say, look at me, I'm an apostle. Hey, you better send me this, you better do this, you, you know. They went out to the front lines of the war of spiritual battles. They went and faced these people of persecution. Paul was many times stoned, left to dead, and he faced persecution. They were jailed, in prison, they were beaten. I mean, they, these people weren't like these so-called apostles today, which were not, by definition, with Jesus physically, literally as the definition of it. But here's the important thing. They glorified God. They did not abuse the apostolic roles. Their intentions as ministers of the Word of God was to do what? To bring the Word of Truth as servants of the highest and only God and humbly declare the Gospel without any burden upon the churches. With any, no burdens. Paul was a tent maker on his side. He went, made tents. He would do those things to help, to help with his funds and things to do that to get by. Believers are to bring the Gospel to what? To glorify and please God, not please man. You know, what excites you? What, what, what excites you? You know, I love to rediscover, teach, and preach the Word of God. You know, I give glory to God for His draw, His call, 
in being one of his elect as we are serving him to reveal the truth to others. That excites me. I'm not one of these itchy ears wanting to preachers or teachers, you know, and, and just, you know, make you feel good. No. We've got to bring the gospel that convicts of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's important. Because we have to understand how we are totally separate from God in our sin because of the sin nature, the, the nature of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, that there's nothing in me, no, nothing good at all, as Apostle Paul says. But only by Christ's blood of the cross, when he shed his blood, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But with the blood, when we call upon the name of the Lord, the blood covers us and washes us clean. And Jesus is our advocate, so the Father God doesn't see our sin, but he sees his son, Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, his son. He alone, and by his grace, his favor on us, the good news, the charis, the charisma, we are deemed righteous, right with God, that we cannot do on our own. Point four, final point. Believers deliver the gospel with gentleness and sincerity. Believers, you and I, are to deliver the gospel with gentleness and love and sincerity. You know, it's such a blessing and attribute of our Lord as to a mother nursing a child, isn't it? It's such a beautiful, beautiful act of God and the, the, the creation of God and, and a newborn child. Well, Paul provides this beautiful metaphor, this illustration to the Thessalonians of a mother caring of a newborn child with godly gentleness. Beautiful thing. Look at verse 7 of our text. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. You know, I looked up that word gentle in the Greek. It's nepios, nepios. It's to be like a small child, a small child above the age of a helpless infant, but probably not more than three or four years of age. So poor Malo, where a mother nurses, feeds the baby, nurses it grows, and is there. And so Paul's reminding the church at Thessalonica of his leadership traits that truly show the care and compassion for the people in the church of Thessalonica. It's a pastor's heart. It's a shepherd's heart. What does a shepherd do? He to keep an eye on the sheep, the flock, right? One gets away, he goes after the, leaves the 99 and goes after the one to make sure that sheep is safe because when we go stray too much, like in church, we stray from the sheepfold, guess what? The wolves come and they want to attack. They won't attack the big crowd, but they'll attack the one who's kind of wandered off. That's why we must stay focused in the Word of God and stay in there. So because we have a shepherd who cares for us, who loves us, who's going to protect us. And, he, and he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. So it's important that we focus on the things, the eternal things of God. Focus on those things and make sure that we have, like Apostle Paul was, a gentle, caring Apostle, a gentle, caring pastor, a gentle, caring mother and father, just like our dad and mom, cared for us when we were probably growing up so much in our lives. You know, Paul reminds the Thessalonican church of his leadership traits and show sharing compassion for them, right? In 2 Timothy, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 24, 2 Timothy, Paul wrote, Timothy, chapter 2, verse 24, and said this, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently, enduring evil. That's another trait, of course, as he's given to, to Timothy, another elder, if you will, a protege of, of Apostle Paul, a young man, telling him, you know, again, this humility, this loving, this kindness, this caring, this gentleness. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas, they revealed the affection for the church, just as a mom would what? A mom would be willing to die for her children, wouldn't he? She will to die. I mean, you love your child. A mom doesn't want to see the child without people. You, you were willing to, to die for that child, wouldn't you? To protect that child, you would do that. So Paul expresses the same kind of genuine love and sincerity for the Thessalonians. Look at verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, they were even ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also of their own selves, their lives, because you have become very dear to us. What a, such, a, such an affectionate love writing in his letter, Apostle Paul, Timothy, and Silas were sharing with this church because they truly were genuine, they were sincere, they, they loved this church, they loved that it was planted there, and they were looking forward eventually, eventually to come to visit them again, but also reminding them that Christ is going to come and return as well for the church, a hope that we only believers have. You know, to be genuine, to love, and to be sincere of faith brings the gospel with what? Gentleness, yet... It's with genuine concern for those of our faith and those who are not of our faith, those around us who are unsaved. 
We are to bring the light of truth, the light of Christ to others who are in darkness. I want to share a story by Bob Woods in Pulpit Digest. Bob Woods tells a story of a couple who took their son, 11, and their daughter, 7, to Carlsbad Caverns. Stop it here. And as always, when the tour reached the deepest point in the cavern, the guide turned off all the lights to dramatize how completely dark and silent with all the lights off and below the Earth's surface there. <clears throat> me. Then the little girl suddenly, enveloped in utter darkness, was frightened and began to cry. And immediately she was heard the voice of her brother said, and the brother told her, don't cry, somebody here knows how to turn on the lights. Somebody here knows how to turn on the lights. In a real sense, that is the message of what? Of the gospel. Even when darkness seems overwhelming, somebody is there to turn on the light. Darkness is the absence of light. There's many people who are in darkness. Many people who need the light of, of Christ to shine through others. You know, the title's message is, Who are you pleasing? Are you pleasing God? Or pleasing the world and feudal mankind in the ways of this world? It's one thing to, to, be, to know that we have Christ in the Lord, but it's another thing if we're, if we're not being pleasing to our Lord and to show and reveal that love to others. Um, it's difficult sometimes because we know there's such hatred for Christianity, there's such uh, the worldliness, the world tries to bombard us and and try to mislead us, and demons and things, and the worldly things that the world tries to, to try to uh, mislead us, deceive us. But we know if we hold on to the Lord, if we know we stick in our word, we stay together, we pray to the Lord, we communicate with God, God's always there for us. He's never leaves us, nor forsake us. He's there for us, and we've got a red hotline. We've got a hotline to the Lord. We don't, we, we have a, we don't, we don't need the, any wide man or internet, you know, Wi-Fi here. We get a direct Wi-Fi that's always on, never fails, right to that Lord God. And all we have to do is call upon the Lord. Hey, Lord, uh, I'm having a time trouble here. I'm, I'm kind of drifting off a little bit. Lord, can you help me get me straight in my faith? I need, my, I need more. Give me more faith, as the apostle said. You know, Show us that faith. Sometimes we need a little more push, a little more edge of the Holy Spirit to kind of get us going back on track. We all have them days, don't we? We feel, ah, oh, I'm lazy. Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, you know. Everyone has those days. It's our nature. And God knows that. God knows that we're, we're in His bodies as sinners. We know that's a, that's a fact of life here. But through it all, we know that only Jesus Christ, Him alone, went to the cross for us, and He paid in full for our sin. For those times we failed Him. And nothing can snatch us out of His hands. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1, 3, 3, 3, 14 talks about that. And 1 John 5, 13 says, You know you have eternal life. Those watching at home, watching live stream all over the world right now, uh, today is the first day of the rest of your lives. And all of us here, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit is drawing you now to the truth, opening your eyes, now is the day. This is the day, the first day of the rest of your life. Now is the day is to call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. Today is the day. Jesus' arms are wide open. And He's waiting for you to come to realize you're a sinner and the only way you can be delivered from your sin to trust in what Christ did and finished on the cross. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the message that we are to put our praise, we are to glorify in God and God alone. For you are worthy, God. You alone are the only one who can give us the light of truth, the light of love. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you for your son, Jesus who showed us and revealed himself, incarnate, came down to this world and revealed you, God, to us. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that we now know beyond any doubt that we are forgiven by your precious blood that was shed on Calvary and Golgotha. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the blessed assurance we do have and your precious love that you showed us and thank you that we have your word, the Bible, we have the scriptures to help us to grow our operating manual. And we can, we can face every day, no matter what challenges around us, no matter suffering or dealing with pain or whatever we're going through, Lord God, both physical and spiritual attacks, Father, we know that greater is he than us, you, and he's of this world. 
Father, help us to continue to be strong and be bold and to be a light, like a lighthouse for those around us to see the Jesus in us. Thank you, Lord. We do pray this all in the name of Christ who is our Lord. Amen and amen. amen. We're going to sing a closing song. It's called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. It's a newest song uh, by uh, Stuart Townsend. Townsend. And uh, truly, his love is so deep for us. It's best beyond all mission. It should be on the back page of that handout. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son to me. knowing that our faith is not in vain. It's not futile. And Father, help us to go forward knowing that your love is real, your, that we have hope in you and assurance, and that, Father, we can trust in you no matter what we're going around us, what's happening in the world. We know that we look forward to something greater, your kingdom. Father, help us to gain insight, to study your word deeper, and to build our prayer life, build our faith, Help us to be strong and bold and courageous in our walk with the Lord. And we do pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And amen. amen. All right, y'all, just have a wonderful day. God bless you all. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, have a blessed week. Go and serve the Lord in, in His love. And thank you so much. We'll see you next time. God bless. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. 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 Amen.